So our next speaker is um, a longstanding um, associate of uh, Allison's, Mimi Cow. Okay, so um, I'm Mimi, and I was um, Allison's fourth graduate student. And uh, I defended my thesis, and one week later had a child. And then I, um, and this was just six months after Allison had her children. And then I stayed in the lab and um, for a postdoc. So I've known her for over 15 years. And in making the list of all of the folks who have been, um, who worked with Allison, I realized that I have met each and every one of them in the actual lab space. So I have known everyone um, from my time in the lab and did not meet people after leaving the lab. Um, and like Frederick and Charlotte and everyone else who's spoken so far, um, one of the things that I admired a lot about Allison was that she would ask really difficult questions. And often after really long lab meetings, um, she would finally sit down and say, you know, I just saw Corey Bargman last week and she asked me, what are the real, really hard questions you want to answer? And how, how are you doing that? Are you doing that hard science? And what techniques do you need? And I, like Charlotte and everyone else, admired her willingness to go where the questions led her. But one thing that um, struck me about Allison was she was demanding, she was meticulous, she wanted to be really careful about the science but she was also kind of wacky. She loved N equals one data. You would show her something totally weird, you couldn't understand it, and she loved it. And she would um, often come and visit me when I was downstairs by myself on the seventh floor in a windowless room with no one else around. And uh, she would just come and see what I was doing and get excited just by hearing the neurons and seeing them. And that always really lifted my spirits. So, Today I'm going to, uh, I've stolen part of Allison's talk, and I'm going to try and channel her and really try and convey to you the enthusiasm that she had for the song system and why she thought we could learn something about um, the brain and um, general principles about um, how the brain subserves learning um, using songbirds. So as um, Allison would say, the brain is a learning machine and many um, cognitive skills and motor skills, such as playing a musical instrument or playing a sport, are not innately programmed, but rather are learned through a process of trial and error, and often after extensive practice. So when you're first thinking about a new problem or if you're learning a sport, the brain doesn't necessarily tell you what to do. It can tell you if what you did was correct. Did you hit the ball to the place that you had intended, or did you not? Or, um, and through, um, and so it's important to be able to vary your way of thinking or vary your movements and to try out different things. And through a process of trial and error and through practice, um, gradually you can learn to master the skill. And um, of course, uh, one of our most amazing types of learning is speech learning. Young children listen to you and learn to reproduce the sounds of the adults around them. The language that they speak and even their speech patterns are strongly shaped by their experience. And humans have specialized areas in our brain for processing and producing these speech sounds. Um, and in order to understand the brain mechanisms underlying vocal learning, of course, it's useful to have an animal model um, system. But not many animals learn their vocalizations. So a lot of animals vocalize, but they don't necessarily have to hear others or hear themselves in order to make those sounds. And among um, primates, humans are the only primates that learn their vocalizations. And among mammals, there, we know that um, there are some marine mammals, dolphins and whales, that learn their vocalizations, some bats and some elephants. But of course, those are hard to study in a laboratory, especially in a crammed laboratory at UCSF. And um, so uh, the animal model that Allison and many of us chose to study 
study is songbirds. So here's a picture of a young um, juvenile uh, zebra finch next to his dad. And um, there are over 4,000 species of birds that learn their vocalizations. And we studied song, um, zebra finches because they uh, breed easily in captivity. They <coughs> develop relatively quickly. So in about three months, you'll get an adult. Um, and you'll see that they seem a, sing a relatively simple song, which helps us in our um, studies. So, um, oh, and also, of course, <laughs> um, so songbirds, like humans, are vocal learners. And vocal learning um, in birds occurs in two stages. So first, young birds listen to and memorize the song of an adult tutor. And then they begin to babble. So the sounds that they make are very um, immature and variable, much like babbling in infants. But they listen to these sounds and they try and fix them. And through a process of trial and error, gradually they're able to make a good copy of the memorized tutor song, at which point the song is said to be crystallized. So I'm going to play some songs to you today from zebra finches. They're not the most beautiful songs, but maybe songs that you could grow to love, just like Allison and I did. Um, Although, there are many people in the lab who can't stand their songs. Um, so, zebra finches sing a simple song. They sing a sequence of song elements. I've labeled these here with um, letters. We call them syllables, by analogy to human speech. And they sing this sequence of syllables, um, stereotyped sequence, over and over again. So here you'll hear the male singing, an adult male zebra finch singing three renditions of this motif. Okay, and now I'm gonna play for you the songs of a juvenile bird who was tutored by this male. And so this is early when he's just starting to vocalize. Okay, so it's really scratchy, squeaky, variable. Um, and now partway through learning, he's starting to break it up into chunks. Okay, and now um, when he's almost mastered the skill. And I'm gonna play the tutor song again for you just so you can hear the similarities. Okay, so I hope you could hear that this male was able to learn an accurate copy of his father's song. Not only are birds vocal learners, but like humans, they have specialized areas in their brains for processing and producing these, um, vocal, these vocalizations. And um, these areas are collectively known as the song system. I'm just showing them here. This is um, a cross section of your brain, the um, cerebellum in the back. And the song system is, um, consists of two parts. There's a motor pathway shown in gray. And this pathway is necessary for producing the song. So if you damage this pathway, um, the bird won't sing properly. And then there's the second pathway shown here in red um, that Allison's lab was really focused on, this cortical basal ganglia circuit. And um, this circuit shares many similarities uh, with similar um, areas in mammals. And I think Allison was one of the songbird neuroscientists who helped to establish that this really was a cortical basal ganglia circuit. What are these types of circuits good for? These are loops that are common across all vertebrates. They're important for learning and producing motor sequences um, and for learning in response to reward. And uh, dysfunction of this circuit often um, ca is the cause of many psychiatric and neurological disorders. And um, so damage to the circuit can result in too little movement, such as in Parkinson's disease, or too much movement, such as in Huntington's disease. And, this circuit, oh sorry, is um, specialized just for song. And so this is really useful because it allows us to look at, um, it, it, it simplifies um, the problem of looking at what is the relationship between the activity in this circuit and a particular behavior. And we've known um, from, uh, from work for the last 30, from 30 years ago or so, that this circuit is important for learning the song and also for changing it in adults. So remember I told you that zebra finches sing a pretty linear song. They repeat the same sequence of syllables over and over again. And um, Sarah Botcher showed that if you damage the circuit now by lesioning this outflow nucleus LMAN, that it's um, in a juvenile bird, that it 
prevents the birds from learning. So it actually just stops song in its tracks. The birds can't vary their song anymore. They can't produce different sounds. And they won't ever learn the father's song. And we know um, from Allison's work with Michael Brainerd that um, this circuit is also important for changing the song in adult birds. So if you damage, again, this nucleus, um, LMAN, birds, adult birds can't change their song um, in response to perturbations of auditory feedback. So one of the advantages of having a model system is then we can go in and measure the activity of um, cells in this part of the brain while the bird is actually singing. And um, as Steve mentioned this morning, this work all began with Neil Hessler, um, who started all of the chronic recordings in the lab. And that is a picture of one of Neil's early birds. Um, we put wires in the brain, and then we can record what's happening, what are those cells doing while the bird is singing. And I'm just showing an example of that right here. So above, again, is a plot of um, about a song. And below it, I've plotted the activity of a neuron in this area, LMAN, while the bird is singing. So each of these black lines, the deflections, show when the cell's active. So the cell is firing. And I hope you can see that the cell is active even when the bird is quiet, it um, fires. But it increases its firing a lot when the bird sings. And because zebra finch is seeing the same thing over and over again, we can align the activity of the cell to the motif and see what the activity looks like, what, what's the pattern across many repeated trials of the song. So that's what I've plotted down here. Um, each of these rows down here, oh, so each of these lines again is um, a spike, the firing of the neuron, and each row is the activity of that cell during one repetition of the song. And below is just the act, an example of the activity of the neuron when the bird is quiet. So right off the bat, I hope you can see that this neuron increases its firing rate during singing compared to when he's quiet, and that it fires basically at the same time in song, and that there's this characteristic pattern of firing that's locked to the song. So all of this data that I've shown you so far was recorded um, by Neil and by me when the male was singing to a female. So he's in a highly aroused state. He's trying to court the female. And um, of course, birds also sing in other contexts, including when they're by themselves. And um, Neil first saw when he looked, what is the activity of this neuron now, the same cell, but when the bird is singing by himself? And you can see right away that this activity looks really different. Now, when the male is singing alone, the activity is much more variable across repeated renditions of the song. And also, I hope you can see right away that um, when the male is alone, this neuron fires high frequency bursts of um, action potential. So it's firing um, at a high frequency when the male is alone, but not when he sings to a female. And importantly, the bird is going back and forth between these two conditions on a moment by moment basis. So in these recordings, we have the male by himself, he sings a little bit, then we whip in a female, let him see her, he sings to her, when he's done, we take her out again and wait for him to sing again. So these um, changes reflect moment by moment changes. When the male is singing to a female, the neuron has a characteristic um, firing pattern that's precisely locked to the song, and when he sings by himself, you see this variable burst firing. Okay, so, the um, activity looks really different in these two conditions, but the songs, um, as you can see on above, don't look so different. And so we decided to go back and analyze the song and see, is there any difference between the directed and undirected songs? And we focused on a feature of song that we know that birds learn, and that's their pitch. And this is um, something that we can quantify. Um, I focused on these syllables that are, we call harmonic stacks. They're like chords. And um, I measured the lowest frequency of this harmonic stack, so like the lowest note in a chord. And um, what we found was that when a male was singing by himself, that there's a lot of variability in the frequency, in the pitch of his song from one trial to the next. So um, you can see, for example, for a particular syllable, the mean frequency is at around 530 hertz. But sometimes he's a little flat, and sometimes he's a little sharp. But when the female is present, the male cleans up his act, and now there's much less variability in his song, and it's much more reliable. So we see that there's this correlation now between the activity and the song. When the activity is more variable, the song is also more variable. And what we really want to know is whether or not this variable burst firing drives the variability in the song. And to get at this question, um, we decided, again, 
to damage the circuit at this outflow nucleus, MAN. Um, we did this with lesions, and Laurie Stepanek also did it by reversibly inactivating um, this nucleus. And by doing so, when we silence this nucleus, we're removing all of the signals that the circuit now sends to the motor pathway. And when we did this, we found oops, that the male now sings as if the female is always present. So his song is quite reliable even when he's singing by himself. And so these experiments were exciting to us because um, you might have thought that the reason that the male, um, that there was some variability in his song when he was alone um, was because he didn't quite know the song and sometimes he made mistakes. But these experiments are telling us that this variability is not, is not um, a bug, but it's a feature of the system. This circuit is actively injecting variability into the song. And, um, and the bird can go back and forth between these two states. So all of the data that I've shown you so far has been in an adult, in adult male um, zebra finches. But Satoshi Kojima, when he was in Allison's lab, um, decided to look at juvenile birds who are in the process of learning. And all of these differences are much more obvious in a juvenile bird. So here I've plotted three examples of the song of a teenage male zebra finch. You can see that there's a lot of variability. He, can, um, he sings the whole song in the first um, row. In the second row, he stops abruptly. And in the third row, he kind of um, stutters, and then he slurs his syllables. But Satoshi found that if he put in a female, that this male was actually able to sing a good version of his song, and he could do this reliably. So the bird knew how to produce a good copy of the Tudor song already at this age, but most of the time, he's singing these crappy versions of song. And we think that um, these studies in songbirds are telling us that there is this circuit that is actively generating this variability in song in the service of learning. Um, and uh, so um, Sarah Woolley, when she was in that lab, wanted to know whether or not the female cares, right? We see these differences in the activity that we think generate um, these uh, differences in song. And, um, through a preference test, she found that females do prefer the directed song, the more reliable, consistent song um, rate. And so uh, all of these experiments, uh, we think, help us have helped us learn some general principle about basal ganglia function, that this circuit is involved in actively generating variability in your behavior in the service of learning. But um, of course, Allison was a psychiatrist, and she was also interested in thinking about um, the connections with um, diseases, uh, human diseases of the basal ganglia. And if um, you think of this circuit as one, if you think that one function of the circuit is to generate variability, then um, you can imagine that what's happening in the disease state is that now there are problems with this variability generation. And sometimes, um, such as in Parkinson's disease and in obsessive compulsive disorders, you might get stuck in a particular set of actions and you can't get out of it. There's too little variability. And in other, um, in other diseases, such as Huntington's disease, there's too much variation in your movement from one trial to the other. Or, you know, you have disordered thought processes and psychosis. And so um, I hope that I've been able to uh, give you a sense of um, the things that we've learned um, from songbirds and to give you a sense of why Allison was so enamored of the system and why she relished her work so much. And here I have just listed all of the people who have um, worked with Allison in her lab, all the students and postdocs and technicians. And this is my favorite picture of Allison. I um, remember it was a celebration of her birthday. And I was in the lab with some other people looking for tin foil to make this crown. And we put resistors on and banana clips, which you know you might remember using um, <laughs> when you were recording, and um, Adria told me, Allison is never going to wear that. She, she's not going to, this is ridiculous. Why are you making this? But she loved it. <laughs> she wore it, and she kept it in her office for years. And so I just think uh, that's a side, that just shows a side of her um, and her fun-loving nature. Thanks.